according to a Buddhist legend, Mahakajipa, the real Mahakajipa, the monk, one of the foremost disciples of the Buddha, is still alive today on earth. I want to tell you about Mahakajipa so that you know how great he is. Even as a human, as a person, not to talk about a saint, he really is a saint. Just like the Buddha, he was a prince, but he renounced everything just to look for enlightenment, to attain Buddhahood. Uh, Mahakajipa was even married to a beautiful woman, the most beautiful woman that anyone could see at that time. In the evening, the girl was crying, you know, after the wedding night, she was crying. And then uh, Mahakajipa asked her what's the reason. So they decided that they would stay together, no problem, and help each other to find the master somehow. I want to thank you with Mahakajipa for being so kind to me. Thank you for the relics of the Buddha. If people have an open mind and they are really sincere in their heart, then they will meet the Master. Do not look at the appearance of the Master. Look into his soul, look to his experience of the spiritual way. Look to see if he can bless you. Look to see if he can lead you home. Please continue watching to find out more. On Sunday, July 14, 2024, our most benevolent Supreme Master Ching Hai, vegan, amidst her intensive meditation retreat to benefit all beings on the planet, took time to send an uplifting message highlighting the life of the venerated Mahakashyapa, vegan one of the foremost disciples of the worshipped Shakyamuni Buddha, vegan. Master also revealed more of the gifts that Mahakashyapa has sent her, her past life connection with him, and where in China his manifestation body is now living. Hi there, all the beautiful souls that uh, descended into this world to give benefits to all others, as many as you are capable, according to God's grace and God's will. I'm glad you are in this world. And I love you for that. And I thank you for that. Even if you do some little good to others, even though you think it's little, but it could mean the world to the receiver. At least your soul is pure, your heart is benevolent, as you are worshipping God, praising all the masters, and thanking all the noble souls who are doing God's will for the benefit of all. I'm glad you're here with me. Otherwise, I probably would have felt or would be still feeling very lonely on this planet as we are kind of far away from home. Though it's not far, but because of physical space, it makes us feel that it's far. But as long as we meditate inside, we can always contact home or make a brief visit to some nearby <laughs> neighborhood of our heavenly home. I want to ask you, please, also, help me to thank Mahakajip. Uh, because I don't think I thank him enough. And I want to tell you his story so that some of you who don't know who he is would feel honored to know him. You see, Mahakajip was one of the foremost disciples of the Buddha, when the world honor one was still alive, and he was named the ascetic number one. Buddha had ten 
foremost disciples. And some of them had a title, like Mahakajipa is ascetic number one. Maudalagayana is like a magical power number one. And the great Anand is good memory number one. Yes. <laughs> there are more. Sariputra is the wisest, for example. And uh, according to a Buddhist legend, Mahakajipa, the real Mahakajipa, the monk, one of the foremost disciples of the Buddha, is still alive today on earth and uh, meditating in a place, maybe a cave in a mountain, which is named Chicken Foot. Yes, so the one who had given me the Buddha Sarira, your sister wanted me to change the photo that they put on in the first place. They were not the ones that Mahakajipa gave me, so she wanted me to change it to the real photograph. I really want to see it now, but I'm kind of far. I couldn't get there quickly enough yet. Besides, I'm still in retreat. I don't want to go too far. I shouldn't. Once you are in retreat, you should be always in one place, as concentrated as possible in one place. Maybe you could be in the garden, but without seeing anybody and without letting anybody see you, so that you can harness all your power for some special purpose. Many people do retreat just to reinvigorate their energy and to harness all the power so that they can accomplish some task. Yesterday I had a talk with my dog people. Sometimes it's telepathically only. Sometimes it's possible by phone. And the dog people even know what I have revealed to you. I did not want to. I did not want to reveal it, but God made me. And after I revealed it to you, I asked God three more times whether or not it is the right thing to do, to reveal to you my real identity. Or if not, please let me delete these parts, because I don't know how people would react. And I also don't know how to react to their reaction. Yes, I just do not feel very comfortable talking directly, honestly and openly like that about what I am. In this physical world, I'm just like you. But I'm connected with my highest self, and that is a different thing. Otherwise, I couldn't have enough power supply to do my work which is a lot, a lot, and very, very heavy work. I want to tell you about Mahakajipa so that you know how great he is. Even as a human, as a person, not to talk about a saint. He really is a saint. He kept his discipline in Buddhism. You have 13 very strict disciplines which you have to adhere to in order to be called the best ascetic. Like you, you cannot eat after noon, and you eat only one time a day. You have only three uh, layers of monks, robes, and you have to collect the discarded cloth on the street, in the cemetery, or in the garbage area where people throw things away. To make your own clothes, you can't wear new clothes, you can't buy new clothes. You can't accept clothes newly made for you. You do it yourself, you pick up clothes everywhere, wherever you can, and sew them together, one piece at a time to make into good warm clothing, to cover yourself with dignity. That's all you can have. And you have a baking bowl for going for arms, yeah, and take care of yourself once a day. And nowadays, 
still there are Hinayana monks who do the same or similar, but then they eat anything at all. They don't restrict themselves to veganism, which is a compassionate diet. Because in the beginning, some people just came and were not used to the vegan diet, so the Buddha allowed them three kinds of uh, permissible animal people meat, like um, those animal people from whose flesh you're eating, you don't hear their cry when they die. Or an animal person that you know is not because of you that he, she is being killed. Or the animal people who die naturally or by accident or old age, you know, somewhere in the forest or on the street, then you can eat them. But later on, the Buddha said, you should not eat that anymore. And he emphasized that whoever eats animal people, meat, is not his disciple. And whoever eats meat, he is not that person's teacher as well. At that time, Arya, or sage Mahamati, or Great Wisdom Bodhisattva Mahasattva, said to the Buddha, Bhagavan, or World Honored One, I see that in all worlds, the wandering and births and deaths, the enlaced animosities, and the falling into evil paths are all caused by meat-eating and cyclical killing. Those behaviors increase greed and anger and make living beings unable to escape from suffering. That is truly very painful. Mahamati, having heard my words, if any of my disciples does not honestly consider that and still eats meat, we should know that he is of the Candela, or killer's lineage. He is not my disciple, and I am not his teacher. Therefore, Mahamati, if anyone wishes to be my relative, he should not eat any meat. The Lankavatara Sutra, Tripitaka, number 671. And the Buddha was strictly vegan. Yeah, you can see some of the excerpts that I have uh, expounded to you some years ago about how I, I say that Buddha was a vegan because he named silk, down, milk, eggs, leather boots, or anything to do with animal people you should not use because it causes suffering anyway. Bodhisattvas and pure monks walking on country paths will not even tread on living grasses, much less uproot them. How then can it be compassionate to gorge on other beings' blood and flesh, monks who will not wear silks from the east, whether coarse or fine, who will not wear shoes or boots of leather, nor furs, nor birds down from our own country, and who will not consume milk, curds, or ghee, have truly freed themselves from the world. When they have paid their debts from previous lives, they will roam no longer through the three realms. Why? To wear parts of a being's body is to involve one's karma with that being, just as people have become bound to this earth by eating vegetables and grains. I can affirm that a person who neither eats the flesh of other beings, nor wears any part of the bodies of other beings, nor even thinks of eating or wearing these things, is a person who will gain liberation. What I have said is what Buddhas teach. Mara, the evil one, teaches otherwise. The Surangama Sutra. Even if that animal person is not killed because of you, if you eat it, then people will have to kill another animal person to sell to other people who want to buy because you have eaten that portion of animal people. So there's one portion missing. One chicken person missing, so if somebody wants to buy, they have to kill another chicken person to sell to you hmm? or to them. The Buddha taught compassion in all of the scriptures that he preached during his lifetime, which was many decades. So if a monk is supposed to follow the Buddha, he should adhere to compassion. 
that is normal. You do what your teachers do. Besides, it is a should not do things. You should not kill others to sustain your life. Just like you wouldn't want to be killed to sustain other beings' life. You wouldn't be willing to be killed so that a tiger can be filled. Eh? No. So similarly, a chicken, a cow, a pig, a goat person would not want to be killed to sustain your life, to fill your stomach. If a monk is wearing, you know, monk's robe, which is very dignified and represents liberation, represents compassion, and just sit there, you know, munching, biting, gnawing, uh, jumping, a chicken person's leg, then I would feel very put off. I saw it before in some uh, Hinayana Buddhist country, and it was really a sight that I would not want to see again. At that time, I was still, you know, married, a household. And then my husband and I traveled in many uh, Asian Buddhist countries. He took me to those countries for vacation because he knew I was a devout Buddhist. In my house, we had an altar, flowers and fruit for the Buddhas. And he even planted flowers and, you know, cut some for me to put on the altar for the Buddha when he saw some flowers uh, with us. Yeah, he changed. And he planted some flowers in the outside garden for that purpose. And now some people argue that the Buddha had advised that the Buddhist followers could eat three types of animal people, meat that I have mentioned above. But later, the Buddha didn't allow it anymore because the disciples had grown up. They should be used to the vegan diet, which is better, compassionate, and it's befitting a benevolent person, such as a monk. So even in some other sutra, or maybe the same sutra, uh, some monk asked him what to do if when he went out for arms, some of the uh, followers give them animal people meat with the rice or uh, the vegetables. What to do? The Buddha said, take that meat part away and eat the rest. So overall, everywhere almost, the Buddha always advocated the compassionate diet, which is the vegan diet. Okay, now even if the Buddha did not force you to eat vegan or allow you to eat uh, the three kinds of animal people meat, I would not want to. Why would we do that when we have plenty of food? Even nowadays, oh God, we could never <laughs> eat all of the food that is produced, not to mention about the no pain food that I adhere to. But not often, even. Even if you just can live with brown rice and sesame, that would be also okay. So I don't think we should argue about eating animal people, meat or not, eating meat, the three kinds of pure meat or not. Yeah, we should not, because to be a monk is really to be in a noble position. For me, huh? Yeah. And the example that you make, by the way you live your life, is enormous to the faithful. They copy you, they learn from you, because they respect you. So we would like to make a very, very noble example, a dignified example, befitting the representatives of the Buddhas, or and the representatives of God Almighty on earth. Imagine how this is sound to you if you are a child of God, if you are representing God, if you are representing the Buddha, and yet you are sitting there showing that you care nothing about the suffering of another being who was kicking 
walking or moving yesterday or a few hours before, before you jump it down. It's just normal common sense. For me, yeah. For you, of course, I think it may be the same. Most of you are the same, except some new ones or some at a lower level have less sensitive feelings. But for me, even though there's no pain food, I myself cannot even personally pluck them to bring in and eat when they are still alive. In the garden, for example, if it's already sold in the market, then I could maybe, but uh, even then, I don't feel very good. I prefer not to eat them. I prefer just like brown rice and sesame. There is enough nutrition for me to do all my heavy work, mentally, intellectually, and all kinds of other aspects as well. But still, if I can live on just very simple food, then I will be very happy. I wanted to tell you about Mahakajipa. Okay, Mahakajipa, he's supposed to be still in that chicken foot mountain, and many people went there for pilgrimage and buying souvenir stuff from there. They believe the souvenir have blessings from the great Mahakajipa. But he himself, the real monk, is staying in that mountain. Nobody can see him, of course. He's hidden inside a cave within the mountain. But he himself has just a manifestation body. And that body is in China as a human, just doing what we're doing as a human. So you see, we all have a duty. Even as you are human, but who knows, maybe you came from a higher heaven and you are still in the higher heaven, your soul, your real self, and you are connected here on earth with your physical body through this kind of silver cord that keeps you alive on earth. As soon as that cord is cut or severed in some way, then you can't stay alive anymore. So Mahakajipa has a manifested physical body on earth, just like a human, just like I told you before, the King of Kama lives near Australia. I don't want to tell you. I don't want you to go there and run around looking for him. As a human, in a human body, but he is a King of Kama, and he's still doing his job, both in the human world as well as in the invisible world, like astral world, for example. Uh, we talk sometimes, yeah. Now, Mahakajipa was a great being, a great saint. As a monk, he lived totally opposite to his life before in a mundane world. He was the son of a very rich family, so he had everything he wanted and lived in luxury. But since young, he always wanted to be a renunciate, to practice spiritually. He didn't want to stay in the house, continue his business, or enjoy the luxury. Just like the Buddha, he was a prince, but he renounced everything just to look for enlightenment, to attain Buddhahood. Uh, Mahakajipa was even married to a beautiful woman, the most beautiful woman that anyone could see at that time in that uh, province, or maybe in the whole country. Excuse me. I I want to tell you why I cough, but I wonder if I should let me ask. Yeah, it's don't worry, I'm not really sick or anything. It's just the karma that uh, manifested from my interference with some war people. Namely, uh, this is the lot the king of Kawa even told me himself because I, I didn't bother so much. <coughs> Sometimes the information just came to me voluntarily, naturally, without me searching for it. Or maybe sometimes I think about the question in my mind and then 
some king of a different uh, department would tell me, would, you know, give me a message. There are many kings of different fields, different uh, missions. They all came to me uh, one day because I was called king of kings of kings of kings, yes. And that also means king of all the past kings and king of the present kings and king of all the future kings. That's why. And there are many of them. King of peace, king of war, king of the wind, king of the stars, king of the north star, king of the south star, king of benevolence, all kinds of kings. <laughs> Even king of the zealous demons or king of uh, zealous ghosts. They all came to me one day. Ah, uh, 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 when was it? Must be last year then. Last year, sometime in uh, April. Yes. Some occasion, they all came just to pay respect. I don't bother them that much because they are busy. They're doing their job, and only when really necessary for some information, I would call upon them. And we talk. So we don't talk a lot, like the way I talk to you. I wasn't aware of such a serious name before. I thought it was too long and they should cut it short. If they want to call me King of Kings, okay. And the other ones, they just say, oh, case, oh, case, means of kings, K O K S. Something like that. When I was writing something and they spell it out to me. I said, don't make it too long. I'm lazy to write. So that's why I was telling them like that. And uh, I said, why do you all have to keep calling me this? It takes too long. Because sometimes they have to spell it to me and they don't call me just you and I. They call me king of kings of kings of kings. And it's just too long for me. So one day they all came and said, this is why we call you king of kings of kings of kings, because you are our king. And in the future, when other kings come, you will also be their king. And in the past, you were also king of all the kings. So now you know also all these questions in your mind, why I have this and that title. I didn't ask for it. The first time, I also didn't know it was me <laughs> who talked to me. <laughs> so I asked, who is it? And uh, I told you already, I said, this is the ultimate master. I said, oh, oh, we're very honored to know you. So the voice said, it's you yourself. There was a, an accompanying being next to the King of Kings who would tell me this and that and others introduce my title to me, <laughs> which I never thought of. Too busy, you know, and what for? Even if I'm king of kings, what good does it do me anyway, yeah? I renounce everything already. It's just that I have to still keep remembering some, because that helps me to draw out much more power so that I can use it to help this world as much as I can. That's the reason why I still need the title, some of them, okay? And uh, I never thought I would tell you uh, that I'm Maitreya Buddha or the king of Dharma wheel turning, because I never thought about all these things. I'm too busy working every day, just like if you graduated or if you're a doctor, you can't keep thinking, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a doctor, uh, how wonderful, how great. No, you're just taking care of your patients. That's all. It's only the patients that keep reminding you that you're a doctor. People who you are dealing with remind you that you're a doctor because they call you doctor this, doctor that. Yes, they even call your wife <laughs> Madam Doctor, even if she doesn't have any doctor degree. <laughs> because she is the wife of a doctor. Yeah. In German they call a doctor's wife also Mrs. Doctor. Yeah. Frau Doctor. <laughs> so it's nice. See if you're a woman uh, <laughs> and you want to be called doctor, just marry one. <laughs> Very convenient. You don't have to study 
many, many years and working so hard for your doctor degree. Mm. <laughs> ah, uh, what else do I want to tell you? Mm. <laughs> I keep telling things and it jumps from one thing to another. Uh, Mahakashipa never wanted to marry, but his parents wanted him to marry, of course, because he's a son, and he will inherit all their business, their properties, and he will have children for them and all that. Yeah, so they really kept pressuring him to marry, but he said he doesn't want to, and they keep pressuring him. So one day he asked a very famous, very good sculptor, you know, who makes statues, to make a statue as the most beautiful woman you can ever imagine for him. And he brought it home. He said, parents, if you want me to marry, this is the kind of girl with virtues, with the heart who wants to also devote to spiritual practice. Then I will marry her. Oh, that was difficult for the parents to find such a beautiful girl. They didn't even know where. And then he said, okay, then let him leave home to beg for arms everywhere in the world, anywhere in the country at least, to find that woman for them. So the parents, because of the <laughs> prospect that he is going to marry, let him go. So even then he was very young, but he already had this kind of Hmong mentality, Hmong spirit, Hmong's heart. So he went out, left the family behind, taking nothing, and with a begging bow, went for arms and walked from one place to another, making that excuse just to find a spiritual teacher worthy to teach him. He was very intelligent as well. He knew many things, he learned everything, and he was perfect in many ways. So many teachers also could not continue to teach him anymore. But as fate would have it, the parents somehow had a friend who found this beautiful girl who looked exactly like the statue that he had made, even though he never met her before. So he had to marry. And the girl that uh, the parents wanted him to marry also had a similar spirit like him. Didn't want to marry, just wanted to find a master and practice spiritually. So somehow she was very sad, very sad to have to be forced to marry because her parents were so eager to marry her because his family was very, very rich. And he was also good-looking, educated, virtuous, gentle, sweet, and all that. So she could not, you know, argue with the parents. In the old times, whatever your parents said to you, you just had to obey, especially in the matter of uh, marriage. They, they picked your partner for you. They picked your husband, your wife for you, and you couldn't say no. Yes. But mostly they would... Uh, consult their astrology, you know, the expert to see if both of them have a compatible uh, spirit, like almost the same things, you know, and uh, have similar family uh, heritage, you know, a richness. Otherwise, there might be conflict. And they ask the astrologers whether or not their children are compatible, whether or not they will be okay. Many other things they ask to make sure before they marry their children to each other. If that family has money and all that, otherwise if it's just for a poor family, they just do it. Mostly maybe they couldn't care too much, they couldn't afford too much. Now, both of them married, you know, but they didn't know each other before, of course. And Mahakajipa doesn't want to, to do anything with a wife. So in the evening, the girl was crying, you know, after the wedding night, she was crying. And then uh, Mahakashipa asked her what's the reason. At first, she didn't want to say it because she 
couldn't believe that she had such a good husband like Mahakajipa. But finally, after asking many times, she told him that she doesn't want to have any physical contact with any man. She doesn't want to be married. It's just because her parents forced her into this marriage, and now she's going to be ruined and doomed, you know, being a wife. So, oh, he was so happy to hear her say that. She just wanted to practice spiritually, wanted to find a real master. She didn't want any kind of mundane uh, physical, you know, thing at all. And then he told her also his ideal. So they talked to each other, exchanged ideas. They both were very, very happy. So they decided that they would stay together, no problem, and help each other to find the master somehow. Whoever finds first will tell the other, yes, by chance or, or by any uh, news or any other person's uh, recommendation. So they didn't sleep with each other, yeah? They had two beds, slept in two separate quarters. And until their parents found out, they didn't like that. <laughs> so then they had only one bed. <laughs> they were forced to sleep in one bed together. But then they had the solution, you know, like one slept and the other walked around or sat in meditation in the other corner, you know, on the floor. And they took turns to do that. Therefore, they never had to sleep together, touching each other in bed. That's the kind of marriage they had. Uh, after they married, you know, one day, the wife was eager to maybe, like, run away or something to find a master to to practice, you know? Yeah, to be liberated, to be enlightened. But... Uh, Mahakashipa told her, just wait a little longer, you know. We can't just leave the parents like this. And he was very filial as well, and a good son. So uh, after some years, you know, the parents died. And then the son, uh, Mahakashipa, sold all the properties and shared it with the servants who have been working in his house in his parents' time since he was young, and also gave it to the poor people uh, in the vicinity. And then both of them just went on their way, just left a little bit, enough for survival. Mahakajipa said to the wife, the road is long and rough outside, so you stay here, wait for me. If I find a master, I will come back for you. So Mahakajipa kept going, going everywhere, and he found many Soko masters, but he didn't feel like they were worthy enough for him. And then one day he met Sakyamuni Buddha, and just after some conversation, he knew this was the one. He was so eager to be his disciple. He knelt down on the floor and begged for it. And so he became the Buddha's disciple, yes, a monk. And then he was so happy, studied with him, went out begging and then studied and meditated. Everything was so good and peaceful. That's just the way he wanted. And he became an arhat in no time. But because before that, he had even been going out uh, baking and eating only once a day already. So when he followed the Buddha, he continued the same. And Buddha praised him. And Mahakashipa, when he was very old already, the Buddha even advised him, told him that he should eat some better food with them, with the Sangha monks, so that he would have better health, a better body. But Mahakashipa said, no, he cannot. He was so used to eating one uh, meal a day, used to this kind of discipline, uh, 13 rules of discipline, so he could not uh, change. So the Buddha said, okay, uh, it's good, it's good. You, you, can, you can stay that way, yes, as long as you are right. And Mahakashipa was all right, and he is still all right. And I'm very indebted to him. I want to tell him again that I treasure the gift of uh, Buddha's Sarira very much, very much. I don't know how to find words to express how much I appreciate it. And Mahakashipa also sent me a bowl 
like an arms bow, a begging bow, and some small pieces of yellow cloth. Mahakashipa is still sitting in Samadhi in Chickenfoot Mountain, waiting for Maitreya Buddha to appear in the world. At that time, he will give Maitreya the bowl which the four heavenly kings gave Shakyamuni Buddha and which Shakyamuni Buddha gave him, and his work in this world will be finished. A commentary by the venerated Master Xuan Hua, vegetarian, of the Assembly of Arahat Sutra, the Amitabha Sutra. I want to thank you with Mahakashipa for being so kind to me. We were friends in uh, earlier lives and we were good with each other, compatible. Thank you for the relics of the Buddha. Thank you for the bowl, like the arms, bowl, the, the begging bowl for the monk. And thank you for the pieces of beautiful yellow cloth as well. But I guess I can't use any of these things that you have brought. The relics are too precious to just use them for anything else. And the bowl, I think I keep it for a souvenir. I'm worried if I use it to eat, then it might go kaput by chance somehow, so I want to keep that. For a souvenir. And for revering. And nowadays, you can wear chasa monk's robes and then go around begging with a bowl. No. It's very difficult to live like that nowadays. Unless you are in some very devout Buddhist country. India, Sri Lanka, Olak, or Burma, etc. Over there they understand Buddhism and they know if you want food. But in our time, Mahakashipa should understand, the Buddha also understands that it's very difficult to go out begging, especially for a woman. And I'm not that young anymore. So I just say eat like one meal a day in the house and I have to do so much work, homework inside, outside. So if I keep going out and baking and coming back, I don't think it'd be convenient for me. Even though I would love that free life so very, very, very much. Now, Mahakashipa. He was already an ascetic, so spiritual, you know, he learned some with other masters before the Buddha. So how come he still had to find the Buddha in order to realize his holy position as an arhat in the short term? Why did he have to do that? Why? Because he knows uh, you have to have a guide, you have to have an expert, you have to have this master who transmits the way to you with the master energy attached to it, in the beginning at least, to help you um, to go back into the inside realm where you belong. Yeah, And then slowly you walk home from the inside realm. If you don't have a, a master, a living master, a, a living teacher, then uh, no matter what you do, you can say that 99% is not fruitful. Even if you can achieve some meditative power, like a seer or some yogic power or something, it's not complete liberation. It's not Buddhahood. You will be reborn again on earth, and then God knows if you can still continue to control your life in virtue morals and beauty or not. Without a real transmission of inner power to you, to open your own power, it's a very uh, slim chance that you could enlighten yourself and reach liberation, or if learning some other method that is not uh, suitable, that is not the ultimate. And after Mahakashipa sent for his wife, huh? she came to study with the Buddha. And in a short while, she became an Ahant also. It means saint already. You know, during the Buddha's time, sometimes the Buddha just talked to somebody. Or they came and talked to him, and the Buddha explained to him, expounded to him the truth. And then that person became enlightened and attained some level 
after meeting and talking to the Buddha. It's not because of the Buddha's talk or voice. It's because of the power emanating from it. And or also that the Buddha will teach that person a method to practice. Maybe light and sound method, the way you are practicing. So it is not like you can just uh, repeat uh, or learn from somebody else, second or third hand from the Buddha. That means produced from the Buddha's teaching, and then you can be enlightened. You see, it has to be a living teacher. And many other monks also like Ananda and other persons, they have to be under the Buddha's merciful guidance with tremendous power from within the Buddha himself. Because he doesn't just impart to you the right way or even a mantra, but he imparts to you also his energy to support you, to uplift you, just like a blood transfusion until you become well on your own which in this Dharma ending time is rather more difficult than in the Buddha's time. But we can make it, and we have made it up to now. We still can continue to make it. And we will not leave the suffering people or beings as long as we are still alive. We try, even though it's hard, it's heavy karma, and it's all kinds of restrictions and limitations. For example, how I live my life now, it's like imprisonment. I can't even walk out, go even uh, just a few hundred meters for a walk or anything like that, you know. (coughs) 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 Even if I want to take some photographs, I have to see that Maybe that place is empty, the garden has nobody looking, or it takes just some steps away from the door. You know, when it's a quiet time and the whole area is empty. Yes. And then when I come back, I have to pay for it, you know, spiritually. I have to make it up more, meditate much longer. But then it's quite busy sometimes. If Shekhamani Buddha had many different uh, religious backgrounds of disciples. And if one of the different religious background disciples had become completely enlightened or the successor of Sikamuni Buddha, maybe this person was not living with the Buddha and was not the monk of the Buddha, but he was somewhere else on the other side of the country or even in another country. Then, according to his master and the Buddha's order, he would either give initiation in his hometown or anywhere else and keep the appearance of his own religious background. So people come there to get enlightenment I don't have to see a person from the same religious order as the Buddhas. So the, the new so-called disciples of this successor will not see a Buddhist monk, but may see a Brahman missioner or Christian uh, priest, for example, like that. That doesn't mean that priest or that uh, missioner does not have enlightenment lineage from the Buddha. It just he looks different because the enlightenment lineage is from inside, just like the blood in your veins. This is an invisible spiritual blood vein, so you will not see. So it doesn't matter if a master has the same religion as the founder or not, like that disciple of the Buddha from a different religious background. He will not look like a Buddhist monk. He doesn't look like one of the Buddha's monks. He might wear the Christian clothes uh, of a priest, or he might just wear a Brahman kind of uh, traditional dress, or he might just wear ordinary clothes, but he is enlightened and he is a successor. 
So this here is the problem with many people who want enlightenment so much and want to have a master. But they're always looking in their own religious system. Like a Buddhist would go look for a monk. <laughs> a Christian would go look for a priest. And same with many other religions. It's like a river. It doesn't have to flow in the same direction all the time. Sometimes it goes underground and then comes up again in another location. And you might think that it's a different river, but it is the continuation of the original river high above from some mountain somewhere. So if people have an open mind and they are really sincere in their heart, then they will meet their master. Do not look at the appearance of the master. Look into his soul. Look to his experience of the spiritual way. Look to see if he can bless you. Look to see if he can lead you home, give you enlightenment. Enlightenment means light. And light the light, you see? So if he could give you immediate enlightenment, just like the way we do with the Kuan Yin method, then you will see the Buddha's light, God's light, or whatever name you call it. And then you will know that Master is capable. Or he can help you to hear the inner melody, the inner sound, the sound of no sound. That is how you know that Master is truly, completely enlightened, or at least an official successor of the enlightened Master. In the Holy Bible, the disciples hear the sound of thunder where there was no thunder, the sound of a trumpet where there was no trumpet, the sound of many waters where there was no water, a river or ocean. They see light as bright as fire, where there was just a fresh living bush. In the Buddhist Diamond Sutra, Buddha said, Do not look for appearance or sound from the outer world, because one cannot see the Buddha there. The Kuan Yin Method gives you immediate inner experiences of the inner world of inner light without light, of inner sound without sound. is all from God's direct inner teaching, from Buddha's direct inner teaching. That's what you must know to be liberated in one lifetime, in this lifetime. Even in the Dharma and in time, in such a desperate, troublesome and dangerous time as our time. So it depends on your luck, hey? Okay, but the criteria is that you have to see the light of heaven and hear the voice of heaven, the word of God, the teaching of the Buddha directly. That's the criteria. Mm. Because if you look for your own religious kind of system, the priest, monk, mullah, imam, prophet, or whatever you name it, then you might be disappointed. Because, as I said, like the river, it runs elsewhere. It doesn't stay in that same place all the time. After a while, it disappears in the ground, and then it emerges again elsewhere. So enlightenment is what you seek, not the outer appearance of someone who should impart that enlightenment to you. So just to say that you can be enlightened alone without the Buddha, without the Master, is, is something almost like impossible. Like you polishing a brick, hoping to make it into a mirror. No, not at all. No. And even if you meet somebody, maybe a monk, a priest, a mullah, a maharaji, and you might think you found the right one. Just after initiation or in the beginning or before, 
you wake up from your samadhi at the initiation time, and you might see the master become exhausted. And sometimes if you have your third eye open or your clairvoyant ability with you, you can see the master maybe being punished being beaten up by those uh, negative demons that jump out of your being and other initiates at the same time. And maybe the, the master can get very sick, either immediately or, you know, a little while after. And then he, she needs to recover his her spiritual strength. So we really are in debt to all the masters in the past and present for sacrificing themselves to the utmost. Some disciples have very heavy karma, but the Master never asks what he did before, how he will repay his kindness. No, nothing. It's all unconditional. It's all love, guidance, and truly caring in God's grace. You feel the love. If truly is a real Master, the moment you, you meet them, you will feel something. They lift you up, even if they just give you a test. Like, okay, close your eyes and recite this uh, Buddha's name or your religious founder's name. Then you immediately will enter into Samadhi. Oh, before, he did not even need to tell you any instruction yet. Yeah, because a master power is beyond imagination. The stronger the master, the more he, she can take more souls back to heaven and make the disciples more comfortable in the physical life. Until then, only the lucky ones in the world truly meet a good master. Okay, if I have any other things to tell you, I think i talk more later. It's no rush. May God bestow upon you all the best. Not necessarily money or possessions, just the best. May you be well, may you be blessed, may you be loved. Know it and feel it. Please do meditate well. Thank God, praise God. Thank the Master, praise the Master. And you will be graced with abundance, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Amen. So long. Most merciful Master, we are ever grateful that you continually share such precious spiritual knowledge that we otherwise never would know to inspire and elevate us all. You set the absolute best example of how we should conduct our lives. Our deepest gratitude for reminding the world again and again that we must seize the very rare opportunity to gain self-realization while we still have a human body by finding an enlightened master and practicing the meditation method they impart. May God Almighty ensure everlasting serenity, calm and security for Master, as well as the very best of health and wellness. To learn about the fairies who inhabit plants and how they've shown their love and respect to Master, the reason Master eats only one meal a day, and the negative effect on Master from shouldering the karma of certain soldiers who've returned home from war, please tune in on Tuesday, July 23rd 2024 on Between Master and Disciples for the full broadcast of this message. Also for your reference, please check out the previous related Between Master and Disciples messages such as The Buddha or Messiah we have been waiting for is here now. The preciousness of the human body, cause less pain and karma, plants to eat, etc. To view these and more related Between Master and Disciples messages, all free for download, please visit suprememastertv.com and search for Story Mahakashiapa.